Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have an early impression video on a house that gets very little talk in FragCon, but I really do believe that it deserves more love. It deserves the spotlight to be shined on it because they have made some amazing fragrances. And we're going to talk about the house of Emmanuel Ungaro today. And the fragrance we're going to be discussing is a fragrance I was able to secure a uh, I believe this is a seven and a half mil de uh, miniature, but I can't say for sure. Maybe it was a 10 mil or an eight mil. I don't know how they did these, but this is basically a fragrance that was marketed towards women and it came out in 1983 and it is called Diva. And first of all, look at the presentation with sort of the cross lines that go in the back to create this aura of glistening glass. Obviously, it's plastic. This particular bottle, this particular version, uh, is the Eau de Parfum. There was an Eau de Toilette, an Eau de Parfum, and I believe a Pure Parfum. Uh, I would love to smell the Pure Parfum one day. But uh, if you look at the bottom of my bottle, you'll notice that it says, if it'll focus, copyright Parfums Ungaro. That is a 1992. See that? Uh, the glass is making it hard to focus. There you go, 1992. And so what ended up happening is Parfums Ungaro ended up selling out to the Salvatore Ferragamo group, who has since discontinued this, which I think is an absolute um, travesty. But that's for another day and another dollar. Um, but basically, from the information that I've been able to uh, procure from kind of looking online... Uh, what ended up happening is that uh, Jacques Polge created this, and you may ask yourself, well, wait a minute, Jacques Polge was the in-house perfumer of Chanel, and you would be exactly correct, he was. But what ended up happening is a, a group of owners of Chanel, known as the Wertheimer brothers, uh, they, I believe they were brothers, may just be the Wertheimer group, but I think they were brothers, if memory serves, uh, owned Chanel, and they also had a... Um, a stake, a major, uh, maybe, maybe a minority stake, maybe some sort of a majority stake in Parfums Ungaro. So what they ended up doing is they ended up loaning their master perfumer, Jacques Polge and Francois de Machy, uh, to Ungaro to help create their scents. So even though Jacques Polge was officially the in-house perfumer of Chanel, he was allowed to go make fragrances for Ungaro. And that's why, if you take a look, uh, there's some interesting connections here. Because if you take a look at some of the Ungaro fragrances from Ungaro Pour L'Homme 1, which is my favorite masculine Ungaros, uh, this is a beautiful, if you want to just pause and take a look at the note listing there, um, this is an old tester bottle, like you can kind of see it's been kind of thrown around and it's beat up, I don't care, the juice inside is spot on, and to Ungaro Pour L'Homme 2 which is probably my second favorite, and it might surprise some people that this is my second favorite, but imagine taking something like Chanel's Pour Monsieur or Tiffany for Men, which I think Jacques Polge and Francois de Machy also were allowed to go work on in the late 80s, and um, just adding an absolute bucket load of civet. A huge amount of civet in the base comes out in Ungaro Pour L'Homme 2. If you're going to do this style of fragrance, this is how I like it done. Animalic and um, slightly challenging. That'll put some people off who are not used to that animalic civet note. And finally, they did a fragrance called Ungaro Pour L'Homme 3, which again, going into bottles, because you know I'm a sucker for hunting down a specific version... This is actually an older version, and you'll notice that um, you can you can kind of tell by the bottom, but uh, you can also tell by the in, uh, packaging, which I don't have with me. It's up in the attic, but it is a shorter ingredient list, if, if memory serves. Um, and the newer bottle looks a little bit different than this anyways. I think my friend Anuj at Enchante Perfume still has some older bottles of this, if you're interested in exploring what it was like back in the day. But this is very interesting, and a couple things that you'll notice in this immediately is there's a vodka note, which is a very weird uh, note to have in a perfume, but there is a vodka note, and the rose here is very dark and reminiscent of rose that you'll smell in a couple other fragrances. If you smell the way that the rose is done, for example, in Antaeus, uh, there's some interesting connections to the way that the rose is done, and I'm going to make the case that... Rose is probably one of the most prominent florals in Ungaro Diva, um, although it's a beautiful bouquet of florals in, in Diva. 
Um, but Rose is really stands out. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, so first of all, before we get started and really talk about the scent, I want to say that if you've been following my channel for any length of time, uh, you've heard me talk a little bit about Diva before. And I've kind of stuck it in a category, which I tend to do. I tend to lump things together. It, I categorize things in my brain. It makes it easier to kind of push everything in, into one clean area when you have so many fragrances to talk about. Sometimes it's easy to get like a starting point, right? And you've heard me do it before with scents like Zeno, Eigner's Free Life, uh, Heritage, EDT by Guerlain, YSL's Jazz, Escada Pour Homme. I kind of lumped those together and I've actually done a video called Connections and I've done a couple parts in that video where I talk about how fragrances have certain connections to me, even if they're not connected at all by perfumer or brand or anything like that, you know, just sort of connections in time or, or feel uh, in, in the way that they smell to my nose. And so what I will say is that Ungaro's Diva falls into a category of fragrances that is probably my favorite, just like I say those late 80s, early 90s fragrances I just mentioned for, for men kind of fall into this category of fragrances that I just love and feel so at home with. Diva is the beginning of a fragrance category that um, goes on for about a decade or so and has you know, spawned some of my favorite fragrances of all time for women. And I feel like there's a little bit of fragrances. I, I feel like there's a little hint of some of the fragrances of the past. And I feel like there's definitely a hint of fragrances that this, ha this has specifically, um, you know, inspired, if you will. So the most um, famous inspiration, if you will, is the one that came one year later. And that's this. That is the Great Chanel's Coco from 1984. So this came out in 83, and I'm going to make the case that this is almost like a prototype of this, that Jacques Polge was uh, testing out a theory at the smaller and less paid attention to house of Emmanuel Ungaro before he really launched the main attraction of Coco. And, and this took off. I mean, this is... Many consider this to be one of the greatest feminine Chanel fragrances ever released, and I am one of those people, I will tell you that. Uh, and one day, maybe I'll even do a comparison video. That day is not today. Today, we're just going to focus on the uh, in, in, on the effect that this fragrance had from throughout the 80s. And so, directly, I would say that it influenced Coco 100%. It influenced uh, Paco Rabanne's La Nuit which, um, again, has some differences, but I, you can see sort of the, you can see sort of the inspiration by Ungaro's Diva. And finally, my favorite of all, even more favorite than Coco. Okay, and I love Coco, don't get me wrong, but my favorite, even when you factor in Coco to the equation, is this. This is Caritzia's Teatro alla Scala. This is, go watch my early impression video of this if you really want to see what I think about this. I uh, fell in love with this. Um, it's probably one of my favorite feminine fragrances of all time. I would put this up there with my favorite feminine fragrances of all time. Uh, you, I could put this up there with Shalimar and Not Bad and I. I swear to God, I love this stuff so much. And this is a direct descendant of uh, Ungaro's Diva. So, um, we're talking about big shoes to fill here. And I hope I do this review justice. Um... But let's 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 get into it. But first, I want to just mention a couple other things that are still on the top of my head. There are some connections that you could make to notes in this that I feel like influenced other fragrances that were big hits in the '80s. Big hits, like for example, I know I mentioned uh, before this came out. So before Diva came out, I think it was probably inspired by what YSL did by Opium, which was actually inspired by a fragrance from the '50s called Youth Dew. So our grandmother smelled absolutely amazing. Uh, and so if anyone ever says you smell like a grandma, take it as a compliment. Um, but then in 85, that tuberose note that's used in, in Devo with that sort of honeyed DNA, if you will, I think directly influenced poison. So I think you could even make the case without being laughed at that what Jacques Polge did here directly affected this a couple years later. And this is considered by many to be one of the greatest feminine fragrances of the 80s. So you can see this connection. My uh, my connections theory is not completely off, off base. 
Um, but let me tell you what I think about um, what a brilliant composition this is from Jacques Polge, by the way. And you can see I've almost completely drained this. So I have, this is a seven and a half mil, I think, miniature of the vintage Eau de Parfum. And um, so I'll tell you what a brilliant composition it is. And, um, you know, if you, um, so if you want kind of a quick breakdown uh, of the way that this makes me feel, first of all, I have to speak a little bit to the feminine targeted side of this because, um, because of the fact that some men are still hesitant about trying fragrances that are marketed towards women. And I will tell you what, it's like a mental break in your mind. You have to just kind of get over the fact that um, when you see masculine or feminine in fragrances, a lot of times that is marketing, just period. Just that's what it is. It's marketing. Um, and, you know, once you get over that hump and you realize that a smell is a smell, a flower smell is a flower smell, a flower is not masculine, a wood is not feminine. Um, you know, Serge Luton did Feminine to Dubois, the femininity of wood. Wood can be considered feminine. It can be marketed as masculine. Flowers can be um, masculine. There was a time in the late 80s when stuff like this was coming out for men. Stuff like Paco Rabanne Tenere. And this is sort of a masculine floral. But why is it a masculine floral? Because they marketed it towards men. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that it was marketed towards men, men wore it and had no problem with it. You know, similar thing with Akitos. Akitos was actually supposed to be this. Uh, and Akitos was supposed to be poison, but it lost out on the brief. Alain Delon scooped in, bought Akitos, made it a masculine fragrance, and now it's considered like one of the holy grail masculines from the 80s. So just keep that in mind whenever you hear that this is a feminine fragrance. Don't just completely do the earmuffs thing or you're not going to kind of appreciate how beautiful this is. So this is basically the chassis that 80s fragrances were built on. And I think that this deserves much more love and attention in the community. So how would you define this scent? How would you sort of um, categorize this scent? Well, it's a question I actually asked myself and I couldn't come up with an answer. Um, I... Some part of me wants to call it an aldehydic floral. Some part of me wants to call it a floriental or a floral oriental. And some parts of me wants to kind of call it a uh, floral chipra. And I think um, none of these descriptors I don't really think would be wrong personally when I really think about it. Because when you look at the note listing, so you have aldehydes, cardamom, coriander, tuberose, bergamot and mandarin orange. And usually tuberose is a no-no for me, a big no-no. Um, and not that I don't necessarily like it, but I have a hard time wearing it. The tuberose in this, I have no problem wearing. Absolutely not. I could wear this. I could wear this as a signature scent. I love this stuff so much. Oh, um, and the, a heart of um, carnation, jasmine, narcissus, orris root, rose, and ylang ylang with a base of oak moss, honey, musk, patchouli, amber, iris, vetiver, civet, sandalwood, and vanilla. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the scent. So first of all, uh, sometimes aldehydes are hard for me to take. And, you know, if you've, if you've ever heard me talk about a fragrance called... If you've ever heard me talk about a fragrance called Rare Petroleum by Histoise de Parfum. There is a very rough aldehydic opening in Rare Petroleum that uh, I'm still sort of wrapping my head around a year after buying that bottle. Um, and aldehydes can be uh, easily overused. I feel like you really have to have a very deft hand to use proper aldehydes. And there's only a handful of um, perfumers that I would say I, I've ever smelled use an aldehyde note where I can just put their name to it and say, this person knows how to use an aldehyde. Uh, one of them is Bernard Schacht by the great Aramis brand. He is, to me, the master of aldehydes. Um, he is on Mount Rushmore. He is, uh, no one does aldehydes like uh, Bernard Schacht. He has almost like a specific style, like a signature when it comes to aldehydes. But very close behind Bernard Schacht is the great Jacques Poles. And Jacques Poles was basically in the process of... Um, you know, putting his stamp on fragrances and making him one of the greatest fragrance 
creators of all time. One of, one of the greatest perfumer, perfumers of all time. Um, and, you know, you think about what he released a couple years before this. We had Antaeus by Chanel, one of my all-time favorites, probably my favorite fragrance of all time. And uh, you think about then what he and Francois de Machy kind of cre created over the next decade or, or decade and a half at Chanel. Um, and I mean, just all time since. Even the stuff that flopped, even um, Bois Noir, which later became Ego East, uh, which they tried to salvage by putting out a flanker and doing Ego East Concentre and Ego East Platinum Ego East and all of this stuff. Um, even the stuff that flopped ended up being a love for the perfume community. It was just at the time, Ego East didn't sell very well compared to the $50 million ad campaign that they gave it. So he was really in the process of like cementing himself as one of the greatest perfumers of all time. And, you know, it started a couple years before this, obviously, but this is a big part of it because this DNA ended up transmitting into big sales for Chanel. And so, um... The aldehydic opening, seriously, one of the most gorgeous aldehydic openings I think I have ever smelled. And tuberose plays a big part in it. And normally, like I said, tuberose is a big challenging note for me to wear, especially out in public. Sometimes, depending on how it can be used, um, it can come across as having this sort of uh, green, slightly camphoraceous um, creaminess to, to it. Uh, this very narcotic it's a very narcotic flower, and I was actually given Tuberose Absolute by Russian Adam, and so I've smelled exactly how the note smells in isolation, and it can be challenging. I mean, it can be... I see why it's so hard to create a Tuberose fragrance done well, and I see why Frederick Mall made it such a point to say, for my Tuberose fragrance, I want to use Dominique Ropion. You need someone that has serious amounts of experience to do a well-made Tuberose note here, Jack Poles absolutely nailed the landing. I mean, tens across the board. The opening is... So, you obviously get that aldehydic floral, um, and uh, it is mixed with this sort of... Um, the, the tuberose is almost infused with this sort of airy grandness. Like, like you're just sticking a... Um, like, like you're just sticking a bicycle pump into the tuberose and pumping it up, you know, pumping up the tuberose and blowing it up and adding this mass to it, you know, and you would think, wow, that's not good. But there's this grandness about the fragrance. There's this, um, you know, uh, you ever walked into like a very old church or some sort of historical monument and like, for example, for me, it was Petra. The very first time I went to Petra, you kind of go, you get on a donkey and you kind of go into this corridor of rocks and they get closer and closer and closer and closer together and you almost have to like squeeze through and then as soon as you squeeze through bam you're opened right you know in front of the of the ancient city carved into the rock and it's even as a 12 year old kid you know the power and majesty of that moment is like wow you know it just like hits you of how beautiful it is that's the opening of diva and I know that makes absolutely no sense, but it's the only way I can describe it. It's just this grand, you know, like one of the biggest things you've ever seen on earth. One of the most important experiences of your life just seared into your memory. That's the opening. It's just, it's perfection. And it's blended with this airy um, aldehydic opening that is mixed instantly with this sort of spicy coriander and cardamom. And the spicy coriander and cardamom sort of gives this um, spicy nuttiness to the opening. So you kind of get this spiced nuttiness that is this mixture of cold and hot. Because cardamom sometimes can feel like a very cool scent, but uh, coriander can sometimes feel like a little bit of a warmer scent. And it just sort of brilliantly melts into this um, spicy combo, this, um, this warm spicy nuttiness that just brilliantly melts instantly into the base. It's like it just sears itself into the base. And the base of the fragrance um, is really truly where the magic happens for me because you start to get things like honey. You get this animalic beeswax honey that um, is mixed with vintage civet. And that vintage civet just screams, you know, of the of the saying whenever Edmund Runitska said that all perfume should shock you. 
And for me, when I spray this now, it's like one of the most beautiful things I've ever smelled. Honestly, it is, um, I mean, this DNA, this DNA for me might be my favorite women's, um, targeted fragrance DNA. This and Shalimar and Opium and those are my all-time favorites. And this is right in that. Now, the question is, is I'm being so, um, you know, you, you can probably tell how this fragrance affects me and how emotional I'm getting about this review. How am I going to keep up this level of excitement when I have to do Coco and Lana Wheat and Tietro Alla Scala is the pro Well, I've pretty much reviewed Tietro Alla Scala, but I did a comparison video between the EDT and EDP. But how do I keep up this level of excitement with Coco? I mean, I would basically be saying the same thing. They smell so similar. Maybe a, a comparison video is, is in order. But um, this is almost like a clinic. Jacques Pole putting on an absolute clinic on how to create a animalic, spicy Shepra, floral Shepra um, clinic. Just taking everyone to the cleaners, just absolutely wiping the floor with the competition. Not even a, you know, it's it's not even close. My my um, you know, my my uh, um, imagery a couple of videos back of Michael Jordan jump, dunking on a kindergartner is is apropos here. I mean, this is Jacques Poles just absolutely letting it hang out. And um, Diva is, forget about masculine and feminine. For me, I mean, this is what perfume is about. This is uh, big and bold and grand. And, you know, it just, um, this is the kind of stuff I want to wear. I mean, and this is why I love vintage fragrances. The fact that this is discontinued is an absolute travesty to me. Um... I honestly don't know what in the world Ungaro is thinking to discontinue this. Now, this is according to Parfumo, so maybe it's not discontinued, but um, this is really Jacques Polge kind of flexing his muscles for me. I mean, this is, um, this, is he, this is him stepping into his shoes and realizing his brilliance and sort of becoming what he was supposed to be, creating this um, just set off a domino of effect across the fragrance world. I mean... The influence that this had on other senses is out of this world. And the florals that you smell in the opening will sort of melt into this floral heart that is going to give you one of the most magical floral experiences I think you'll, you'll ever smell. But it's lead. The leader of the group is the rose to me. So again, the floral, the floral notes are tuberose in the top, carnation in the heart, jasmine in the heart, narcissus in the heart, Rose in the heart and Ylang Ylang in the heart with iris in the base. And so there's this, um, there's this dusty, dry sort of ro ambery rose. Imagine like an ambery rose dripping in honey, dripping in like this animalic 80s civet laden honey. And that's what you get. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you get. But the rose, um, many people don't think about this as a rose scent. It, um, it doesn't get the, um, it doesn't get put on top 10 rose lists or, you know, when people talk about their favorite rose fragrances, it's usually fragrances that are targeted towards rose. You think of things like, uh, Lyric Man by M. Waj or something like that, right? Um, but as far as, as far as like a sleeper rose scent for me, this or Coco or, you know, any of these, this DNA I could easily make a case for one of my favorite rows because the rows sort of leads the way, um, but it doesn't overpower the other floral notes. And I'm not a big floral fan. I mean, there's jasmine in here. There's white flowers in here. There's tuberose in here. Those are sometimes big warning signs for me. And yet, Jacques Poles mixed this in such a way, it's so expertly blended. It's almost hard to pick out individual notes. You just sort of get this... You know, picking out individual notes feels like a newer niche thing for me. You know, like back in the day, no one was reading a note listing online trying to say, now where's the Ylang Ylang, Jack? No, no one was doing that. Um, they were just smelling it as a whole and enjoying it for the composition that it is. And um, you'll notice how the base gives off this feeling of real oak moss, this textured feeling. And every it feels like every single note just pops off the page. It's like 3D. Um, and I think part of it, the secret weapon, obviously there's a green earthy patchouli that you will get. There's some beautiful sandalwood in the base. But um, the, the mystery of this fragrance, the 
um, you know, sort of the uh, trump card, if you will, is that there is this iris that Jack pulls, pulls out from behind his back like a magician. And the iris mixes with the orris root to add this absolutely posh um, Chanel quality. I mean, if, um, if this was in a Chanel bottle, it would not bat an eye. No one would even think twice about this being in a Chanel bottle. This has that high class bourgeoisie refinement. This has this upper crust, you know, this, um, it has this, uh, this, this, this pure class about it, but Chanel style class, like, uh, you know, not, not, you have to flaunt it class. Um, you know, you know how old money doesn't have to scream. That's what this has a little bit of. It has sort of that, um, I'm so rich, I don't have to buy a Bentley to show off to you because I don't care what you think feeling, you know? That's that's Ungaro Diva to me. And, I mean, uh, it's just so posh and powdery and so well blended. And um, you guys know I love Animalic Civet. And so the Civet and the base, it just, the entire experience, everything into the dry down. Now, to be fair, I will say this. Some, sort of, some of this ambery, animalic, you know, big floral heart. As the hours tick by, it does sort of dry away, and you're left with maybe a little bit more of that um, beautiful sandalwood, musky, patchouli, what's left behind, you know. Um, but the journey is absolutely beautiful. It lasts forever. I have no clue. 12 plus hours easily, I would say. 12, I mean, I don't really care about that. Um, I would just reapply, although I can't really reapply because I've pretty much used this all up. But, um, but yes, I mean, I, I, I would buy a full bottle of this, but the question I keep asking myself is, do I need a full bottle of this? Um, when I have stuff like this from, from 84, which I very stupidly left off my 1984 ranked video, someone should just slap me. I just said, stick it in the top five somewhere and, you know, be happy. Um, and then I have stuff like this. And then I have stuff like this to use, you know, multiple bottles of this and multiple bottles of this. Do I need a bottle of Ungaro's Diva? No, probably not. Uh, I think that this video will just sort of stand as a testament to my thought on this DNA. And, um, but if a full bottle falls in my lap, a, a vintage, or maybe the Pure Parfum or something like that, um, would I, would I pull the trigger at a fair price? Yeah. Yeah, I think I would. I think I would pull the trigger just because I love this DNA so much. And um, to me, it's part of fragrance history. You know, if you want to learn where we're going, the only way forward is to go backwards in the fragrance world, in my opinion. That's that's what I've learned. Uh, I've learned that new releases will almost always let you down, almost always. And if you keep asking yourself, why does everything smell the same in the fragrance world? Where is the risk taking? Where 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 is the houses that are willing to take a chance, that are willing to try something new, that, you know, have the balls to stand on their own and, um, you know, stand against the crowd and do whatever they want. You're not going to find it in modern fragrances. Or if you do, they're going to want $1,000 a bottle. I mean, it's just what it is. Um, or 500 bucks a bottle or whatever obs obscene prices that modern niche fragrances are going for nowadays or the modern artisanal scene or, or whatever it is. Um, and that's why this is so valuable. You know, I think I paid, I have no clue what I paid for this. Less than 20 bucks. Absolutely less than 20 bucks it was. Um, and, you know, it, it, where are you going to get an experience like this today? You're not. I mean, if you've never smelled vintage fragrances, this is going to be like uh, an initiation for you. This will be like, um, welcome to the big leagues. Um, and it is... Um, it is uh, absolutely stunning. So I think I've drooled over Diva enough for an early impression. Um, I hope this has helped, you know, kind of uh, sort some facts out from the past, talk about a fragrance that deserves to be talked about more. There's almost no reviews of this on YouTube, literally nothing. You know, I, I saw maybe a channel that um, did a review eight or nine months ago, and I saw some small little things here and there. Some people put it as like, small lists, you know, this, uh, this vintage fragrance I bought that is awesome that you should try list, but there's almost nothing, almost nothing on this. And this is the type of content that I want to do. 
This is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, this, this type of content, these type of uh, fragrances deserve more love in the community. They deserve more limelight. So I've got a busy schedule this week. I'm going to try to upload as many videos as possible. But um, if I am missing for a few days, worry not. Uh, I'll be back very soon with some more videos. I appreciate everyone's support. I hope to see your faces in the comments. Like, liking and subscribing and all that stuff does help the channel. Uh, although you obviously don't have to. And I don't have to mention it. But I feel like I should because the more people like and subscribe and comment and all that stuff, more and more people are slowly coming to our cause. And I really feel like we're building up an amazing community here. And I'm very proud of that fact. I'm uh, Every time I get a message from somebody that says, thank you for turning me on to this and, you know, uh, that you've really changed the way I experience fragrances, that, that means the world to me. So thanks everybody for watching. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.